to come and join us. Right, well, uh, we've seen the film. Uh, it was made by Grammar Productions. It was written and narrated uh, by Alex, who's sitting here. Uh, a lot of it seemed to be from about 2016, just on, on my clock. Um, so can you just, before we bring on also when can you give us uh, a little bit of background on the film, how it came to be made? Absolutely. Um, thank you, everyone, for cutting this on. That's a shout. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Use the uh, microphone. Great. Sorry. Thank you, everyone. Uh, amazing to be here for the first time at the Foreign Correspondents Club. Um, well, welcome. Uh, the film uh, started in, the original idea was in 2013, um, and it, was, um, it wasn't until 2014 that I met this wonderful man, uh, quite accidentally. Um, and after two more years of running around trying to make a film and trying to get a film funded, as many people in this room will know, it's very difficult. We were incredibly lucky to win a film funding prize uh, from the estate of Alan Wicker, um, which allowed us to, to produce the, the film that you've just seen. Um, as I said, it took, so the whole thing took about four years, and we were very lucky then to, to actually see the first credible election in Myanmar's modern history, um, and to follow it through the eyes of this family here, who, as you'll see, are absolutely wonderful. Um, and it wasn't easy, we didn't really know what we were doing, um, but thankfully it came out all right. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah, huge thanks to, to, to the Wicker's World Foundation for making it possible. Uh, we can't wait to see Pylon's film next year. It's a lovely coincidence that we're all here in the same place. Um, so, yes. So, also win. Um, I don't think we've had an interview like this in the club before, so what were you actually doing before you discovered there's a reference to you being a civil servant and there's scenes of you training the under 19 uh, football, uh, football team you're over 70 can you give us an idea of what your life has been like up to that point my life is very simple very simple because after graduation I joined foreign service and then I had a chance to serve in Hong Kong in 80s and after that in Washington DC and then after that I was in Beijing and my last posting was in Tokyo, Japan. And after, after my retirement in 2009, I joined uh, Myanmar Football Federation. It's a very exciting uh, kind of a job well, football, see? because football is our national sports or game in our country. So, but luckily, I had a chance to be a manager of that under-19 team, which we managed to qualify for the under-20 World Cup in New Zealand, and and then after that. My, I think, uh, of course, them, not, not much success, I decided to, <laughs> to retire. And then, after, uh, during that, I think, in 2014, I met these two, this gentleman, and there's another friend, Max Jones, by chance. Because, actually, he, they met my son first, and they are talking about, and they want to know, he want to uh, document about the royal family. But my son didn't mention anything. One day, <laughs> we were having dinner together, and he said, he's looking for Uso Win. I was sitting in front of him, <laughs> <laughs> and, and my son <laughs> didn't say anything. Then, yes, I'm Uso Win. Then this, uh, this documentary started. So actually, they found us. They means they are the British. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we lost. 
That's why now the title is changed to We Were Kings. Because first they started with the Burma's Lost Riots. That's why I said we are not lost anymore since they found us. We are very grateful for them. <laughs> and so after that, see, we managed to walk among ourselves and very, I think, kind of uh, challenging. With the uh, last week, we formed an association back home, Myanmar Riot Descendants Association, but not officially uh, uh, see, uh, yet, but started with Facebook and all these are. Uh, we already started, started with uh, senior monks and then the honorary uh, patrons, patrons, and you know, which role I'm taking? I'm an organizer. So they want to give me the position. I said, no, it's not my job. You know what I've mentioned with my cousin, see? I work for my country, so I don't want to be a royal, but I cannot run away from this since I have the blood inside me is, uh, is, uh, is pushing me to, so, I, so now it's a very important uh, kind of a, a turn in our country. Because in those days, see, since 1885, we lost everything, our identity, our uh, values and integrity. But now we are trying to get it back. Not, we're starting from the very basic. From the very beginning, we were together among ourselves, and then step by step, we go to the very basic level to bring back the identity, the value, and integrity of our country. It's a very basic one. That, uh, that's a very, I think, a short uh, explanation I'd like to make. Thank you. Um, you mentioned you have a career in diplomacy. Um, what, what level did you rise to? Uh, my, my last uh, level was uh, in, in a diplomatic circle, we call it minister. But in a, a foreign ministry, we call it deputy director general. That was, because I cannot be a director general. Because my position is stuck there because Higher can, I cannot go much higher. This is the, the, the most uh, the highest. It's a, it's a military position above, isn't it? Mm, yeah, that's very simple. <laughs> <laughs> How did I guess? And um, when you go around um, and introduce yourself and you say, my great-grandfather was King Tibor, maybe you don't say this, but what, what is the reaction? What do people say? Because actually, I, I've mentioned, see, I don't want to be a riot because, see, uh, you know, our country was in a, experienced a lots of problems before British annexed. See, because when the British annexed, half of our country was already under British. So you just imagine. So I think, uh, and, and, and after the annexation, 1885, see, the, the, that, that history, the then history, that time history was, see, uh, very much one-sided. You see, you see the, in the flame that the king was being, I think, kicked with a whiskey bottle was handling and like that kind of, see? Because during the time, the people thought, the majority thought, they have to thank the British because they take away the incapable king. So that kind of, see, uh, history was being uh, told in those days. But later, when we got independence, our country was still not, uh, see, uh, peaceful up till now, nowadays. So I don't, want to be a royal means, I don't, because you know, that kind of a system is not anymore. But at the same time, I still have a kind of a responsibilities 
as a citizen. Of course, this kind of royal matters, nobody can do that. If I cannot do, who will do it? That kind of, uh, see, uh, 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 kind of uh, something comes up in my mind. That's why I start from the very basic that I want to get hold of these. Because, you know, because we have uh, three palaces. Now, the latest one is a uh, Manly Palace, and before that was uh, uh, Marapura Palace, and then very first, uh, Kongbong Dynasty, there's a uh, Shuibu Palace. Very big one. Now nothing, there's all gone. Only the Manly Palace was left. So I'm going to get back what, not in a kind of a, see, a full scale, but any kind of a, see, area like to let the uh, new generation knows that thousands of years we have been on our own and we have been standing on our feet to get to that stage. So this is the uh, kind of a situation I've been uh, dealing with. Right, there is a microphone in the middle of the room for anybody who wants to ask a question. Um, in the meantime, uh, you mentioned that in the film it's mentioned that there's this Royal Descendants Association. Presumably that's not a, a political party of any kind, but is there any serious movement for the restoration of the monarchy in, in Myanmar? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> of course, it's, what we have, I've told you in, in the film is not the time. Of course, not the time means First, see, our country is now divided. We want all to be united. First, this is a very important thing. It's very much more important than to bring the monarchy. See, but that's why we are trying to get the, not the support, to get to the basic needs well, because, you know, these places have been uh, very precious for historical heritage, heritage. So we have to maintain that. Nobody is going to do that. So, so that's, uh, we royal family members start forming the association not to see, uh, get power or not to go into politics or to go into monarchy, monarchy system, but to help the country, because from the very beginning in my mind is that if you are a royal, you have to help your country. That I've been see, uh, taught from the very young. That's why if I cannot do much, see, how will I say I'm a royal? Because if I, that's why I say that I'm, I'm a royal later. I want to do very basic for the country. I think, can I just, I mean, yeah, just say sure. something about that? And I think what's, um, what's being said right at the end from, from Todebi Tansin and Suda Shah about the importance of remembering. Um, and it's not really about restoration. It's not what this film is about. And sort of, well, what happens next is, is out of our hands. Um, but it's about the right to remember. And for anyone who works in Myanmar, knows about Myanmar, you can't escape... Um, the sort of patterns and political culture that, that monarchy brings. And if you want to understand how Myanmar works, uh, if you want to understand why Myanmar is the way it is, then you need to understand this period of history, you need to understand these characters. And one of the big motivations behind making this film was, as Dordevi Tansin says at the end, so people can take it and watch it and, and I guess, get new eyes on, a, on, on their country. So it's not about restoring uh, the monarchy, it's about restoring the right to remember it. Okay. Question. Please identify yourself. Oh, <coughs> sorry, I have a bad throat. Uh, my name is Lika Shankar. I'm from India. I write for a newspaper, The Asian Age, there, and because I have a lot of questions. <laughs> First, to the, to the author, I mean, my comment was that the British took away all that the royalty had, and it seems to me that you're single handedly trying to at least bring back some of it in terms of memory. Um, to you, sir, um, 
I wanted to ask you because the royalty in India, I mean, since you lived in India for so many years, there's a lot you can, you can take from them. And the two most important things that I feel that you're trying to do is one is retain or re, uh, reinstate the heritage so that people know about what it was all about. And the second is your own contribution. Do something for your country. And these are the things that all the royalty in India, once they lost their power, this is exactly uh, what, their, um, what their motives were. And a lot of them have turned into politics for that, especially in Jaipur, if you see. So uh, when you have all this, um, you know, desire and passion, in fact, what impressed me most about the film was the passion that you still have and the commitment and the humor, all of you, you know. And another thing which the royalty in India have done is there are so many palaces and they haven't let it go. Uh, a lot of them are, set, uh, are given to tourists. There is, there is a famous palace where the king stays in one end, so they still see the beauty. A lot have been converted into hotels, but the heritage is very much maintained. So I just wondered if you had any comments since you lived in India and you're probably aware of all this, whether some of this you could possibly try out in Myanmar. Thank you. It's one of the very good idea in my mind also. Because we, actually, it's not only the one way. We have many ways. Because actually, I form a many groups. Because this royal descendants, because I do not want to be involved in the royal royalties. That my main uh, see, uh, intention is. Because I want to get involved all the levels. Because now I'm going, what I'm trying to do is my great, uh, great, great, Grandmother's place, they call it uh, Naoshe area. She was, uh, uh, in, uh, she was that, uh, she, she was titled for that area. My, my great grandfather's mother, Queen, Queen uh, Naoshe. That area is now, uh, from the, the township level, it comes to the village level. So I'm going to start with that, uh, uh, see, place, to go there and tell everybody you have to walk on your own. See? Don't rely on others. Because, see, because we have been, see, from the, uh, we, there have been uh, no electricity all there. So I just started to go to that base to let all the peoples know that we will help them, but not as a royal, not, not as a royal family members. Not because of my great great grandmother's place. Because, of I am a citizen, and but let them value their place. Let them develop their own see, uh, uh, place so that they will be proud of. So that kind of, uh, see, uh, that, that's what's a very good idea that. That's why we have been planning to, because there's only one palace left. See, uh, Manly Palace. See, you just imagine. It's, it's interesting you mentioned India. Um, obviously, there's a nice historical quirk in that the last Mughal emperor of India is buried in Yangon, <laughs> um, because of the British. Uh, <laughs> so a first practical hurdle to any movement of, of kings would have to be a two-way thing, possibly. Um, and his situation is even more complicated than that of King Thibor. I mean, reclamation, I, I don't... For fear of upsetting the sort of British diplomatic community, I'm not on a one-man mission to sort of, you know, empty the British Museum uh, and send it all back, which would be a big problem. Um, the the idea of remembrance, I think, is really important. That is that is, and a big passion of mine is about education. The education system in Myanmar has been terrible for a long time, um, and if we can play in some small part to develop the historical uh, curriculum, I think history is seen as the worst subject to study in Myanmar because you get no jobs from it. <laughs> uh, someone who also studied history. Um, you no know, jobs from it and also, um, you know, it's, it's very boring. But it isn't. Myanmar's history is fascinating. Um, I mean, one, just one story about bringing things back. I mean, So Win and I did go to London hunting for the famous <laughs> Namak Ruby. Um, it's on the BBC somewhere if you have a, have a look around. Um, we went we went all over the place, the Tower of London, Buckingham Palace, uh, the Victorian Albert Museum, 
and it's it, it's it's essentially Burma's Namauk. If you haven't if you haven't heard of the uh, sorry Burma's um, Koinor, if you haven't heard of the Namauk ruby, it's held in that esteem in Myanmar. People might not know about Thibaw Min, but they know about the Namauk. Um, and so we went looking for it in London to see if we can find it. The conclusion is we think it's somewhere in the Royal Collection, but nobody would talk to us. <laughs> uh, so that's about as much trouble as I'm willing to cause at the, at the sort of, you know, being allowed back in. <laughs> right, question. Yes. Um, my name is David Brown, I'm a travel writer <coughs> and a retired BBC producer. Uh, congratulations on a very interesting and informative film. There's one element which I can't gra quite grasp yet. What is the nature of the opposition to bringing back the remains of King Thibor? Because it doesn't seem to be the government. <laughs> the British are out of the way now. <laughs> What's the obstacle that's holding you up from bringing back your great-grandfather's remains? No, no. I, I like to uh, explain it because in our family, you know, my uncle said, "Let them lie in peace." You know, my uncle, he's a grandson of the king and queen, and and my cousin, great grandson, great great granddaughter said, "Not the time yet." But from me, for me, from the very beginning, I already decided, not because of ourselves, ourselves not because of the royal family, because of the majority of the people. If you go around and ask, every, I think almost 99% will say, want to take it back, although they are not the royal family member. Because th th this king and this king is it belongs to the country, not to the royal family. That's what my idea is. So I think let it be decided. Because it's not easy to bring back also. So what I'm doing now is I'm planning to put one open grave in the Manly Palace. Like what the last king of India did. In India, this, the last king of India's open grief is still there. That's why I will try to manage to put a see, tomb of my great grandfather's in advance. So then I said, I, I've already done my part. That I can, I think I can manage to do it in the Manly Palace. But bringing back means we have to decide we have to put up to the parliament, I think. It was done in the parliament also, last government. It was recorded only in the parliament. 2012? 2012, yes. So this is the, the background of this. So I think you just imagine, in a family, a whole, the same family have three opinions, but the majority of the people wishes to bring back. So that I will follow the majority, not my uncle or not my cousin. It's, I mean, it's a curious thing, um, a royal body. I mean, in, in, in the UK, we just dug up one in a car park um, <laughs> from, from 1485. Um, and it caused one hell of a row about where to rebury him. So back in the car park or in Leicester or York or, or Westminster Abbey. And I think that's just part of it, is that then it's not a, it's not a person anymore, it never was. It's, he is the representation of, at that time, a nation of a political system. He's also, you know, he was uh, the head of, of the religious order in, in, in Burma at the time. I mean, there's a very, there's a very interesting conversation going on while we were there, um, that the large Buddhist community in Maharashtra weren't, were, were quite keen to see some part of him stay. <laughs> Um, because the fact that they had a, 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 a Buddhist king in Maharashtra was a huge bonus to them in their, in their sort of um, struggle to be, to be recognized in Maharashtra. Um, and anyone probably know more about that, but it's very, very interesting that I hadn't even anticipated. I mean, the, the practical problems of if you move one, if you move Thibaw Min to, to Myanmar, 
what do you do with Bahadur Shah uh, from, from India? Um, you know, where would he go back to? He was a Muslim monarch in a now Hindu majority country um, you know, that's now three. So where would he go back to? So I think there's plenty of obstacles. And then you know, the cost, I mean, one of Devi Thansen's argument is, you know, is now the right time, just, you know, it, it would be expensive. Um, but I think as Thant Yanu says at the end, um, you know, it's a voice always to listen to. There's some things that are worth our p paying for because it's part of history. But mm. I mean, ultimately, it's not my decision, it's, it's yours. <laughs> Queen, you. uh, sorry. S uh, Queen Supayalat, Sup Supayat, Supayalat, Supayalat, Supayalat. Uh, died in Rangoon in 1925 and she's entombed there. So if your great-grandfather was repatriated to Mandalay, where you want to open this grave, would your great-grandmother also be moved up to Mandalay? That's from the very beginning, in 1925, when my great-grandmother passed away. Uh, everybody wishes, everybody means not only the members, the many uh, the, uh, supporters which is to entomb in Mandalay but during the time it was still under British so authorities do not permit it then this tomb is we call it a temporary tomb we, we regard it as a temporary tomb but later I think we have to decide <laughs> we cannot decide it will, we have to be uh, put up to the parliament and then the, well, the majorities will I think it uh, Decide. Well, it's, uh, it's now a hundred year old temporary tomb. Um, in, and I really encourage you if you are going to Yangon, it's on the south road approaching Shwedding on Pagoda Road, in between Dorkin Chi, the mother of Doan San Suu Chi and the wife of Aung San, and Uthan, the, the third Secretary General. She is between them there. Often people don't go and visit her, but you should. Um, I mean, what was amazing, and you should, if you are interested in the, in the real detail of the story, there's a fantastic book written by Suda Shah uh, called The King in Exile, which I'd encourage you all to buy. It's also available in Thai, and the, the wonderful translator is right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's gone through 11 editions now in, in Thailand. Is that right? More? 11. 11 editions. Two or 11. Um, and uh, it's an amazing book in terms of detail, and one story from that that I hadn't known until I'd read her book was the funeral of Queen Supiala was the first time uh, since the annexation. So she died in 1925, so 40 years um, after the annexation, that the royal family was allowed to be mentioned in the newspapers. There had been a total blackout of mention of the royal family since the annexation in the, in the, in the newspapers in Myanmar. Um, and there was a, a massive funeral procession for her of people coming because so many people remembered the royal family. Um, and I think what, what Devi Thansen says in the film, you know, that, that ceremony now around her tomb was attracting six or seven people. And that is a sort of concerted effort to forget um, by the powers that be. And I think if one thing we can hopefully do is to remember some of these characters. I mean, she's a fascinating character for many reasons. Um, but, yeah. Question. Um, Michael Mackey, freelance journalist, author of the book Sulfated Dreams, which coincidentally is about histories being reconstructed, although it's how music and um, vast amounts of drugs can reconstruct memories falsely. That's <laughs> another story. Um, two questions, if I may. Oh, it's interesting. I'd advise you to buy it. Um, two, two questions, if I may. The first one, in the film there is a reference made to the fact that the much older brother and sister didn't see each other for a number of years. Mm. Why? First, were they kept apart? Was there a split within the family? Or was it just impractical? Why was this reference to them having not seen each other for periods of time? And the second one is, well, answer that one first, please. Because that's more for you, Sue Win, I suspect. I think you mentioned that. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, the, I mean, the, the history is facet. Again, I'd really point you towards Sudha Shah's book. In brief, um, the, after the king died in 1916 in India, uh, the family, the, his wife and daughters had to wait out the end of the world war currently going on at the time, and then they were allowed to come home. 
But there was a huge political ruckus about this family any time they tried to do something. Um, and it, it took sort of Westminster having to chew it over for months and months and months to let her come home. So she came home in secret, largely. Um, and her fourth daughter, who is the grandmother of Uso Win, uh, had six children, two of them, which you saw there, the, the, the grandchildren of the king. They were watched over very closely uh, by the British government um, all the way through till World War II and their expulsion from the country, uh, the British expulsion from the country by the Japanese. So um, during their time growing up, the reason they speak such impeccable English is a lot of their schooling was paid for by the British government. Um, they were moved around the country because your grandmother was a real troublemaker. She sent a 30-page letter to the League of Nations asking for the country back. And all of the possessions, and the, ki uh, yeah, and the kingdom. Uh, so she was exiled. So the family was moved um, many times during their childhood and was always, was always watched. I mean, one story which is amazing. Uh, in the late 50s, General Ney Wynne actually called on the royal family um, in his early, very popular days to, to help in a drive to sort of promote Buddhism in the country. And it was the first time the family had been, uh, so, that, so that, that generation had been brought out in public and been shown, really, to the, to the public since the exile. And the response was so overwhelming uh, towards the two elder ones and their siblings. Actually, women were placing their hair on the ground so that they could walk on it. Um, that that Nawin said, nope, no more of that, you're going back in your box. Um, and that was really the end. And after that, they were looked on suspiciously by the military government as well. So that, that pattern of suspicion continued throughout the 20th century. Right. Um, it, that, in a way, maybe explains my second question. You, sorry, um, what I was going to ask was, several times you made this reference to the bad British. Now, I want to put that one aside. But there seems to be a problem that I have personally with this. Maybe other people do. Why do you want to bring back something from so long ago when we have a fragmented situation in Myanmar anyway? And this could be a very dangerous precedent. You only have to look at what has happened in Russia with the rest, not the restoration, but the reinternment of the Romanovs and how this triggers these quite dark currents within Russian society. And I feel uncomfortable. I think it's on a human level as well. Let sleeping dogs lie. I can understand that. But you, it seems to me you want to restore something which is, myth is being made, is mythalized. I don't know how to conjugate that properly. And I feel uncomfortable with it. It's like you want to restore something that was never there in the first place. This idea of the perfect Buddhist king. Well, it's not the first time. Well, sorry, you're uncomfortable. Yeah, no. No. I mean, do, you want, do you want to have a go, or shall I? <laughs> well, uh, maybe I'll have a go at it first. No, you, you go. I explain very briefly. I understand what you mean, mm. but it is, we, we can call it uh, internationally, you see, because you mentioned Russia. But like I have said in the film, I work only for my country. So, what my people think, I will try to do. Th but you know, when I, because I've got that feeling, when I arrive to that place in Ratnagiri, they call it the Tibor Point. Every evening, my great grandfather went to that place and longing to go back home, looking to the Arabian Sea. Actually, the Arabian Sea is facing west. It goes through the see, Ar Arab and all these places. But geograph geographically, it is uh, different, uh, opposite. But they came from the sea. They were being taken by from the sea route, and then they arrived Ratnagiri by a sea route. So, so this is the place they were taken, and this is the place to, be, to, to return. So that kind of see, feeling. So I got that feeling, you see, when I arrived there. So, I, so my great-grandfather, every evening, he wishes to go back home. I want to fulfill that wishes. But at the same time, not only me, the rest of the people, from the very beginning, in when we gained independence in 1940, no, no, not, not during the, in 1925 also, 
when my great grandmother passed away, the the the, the, the nationalists they call it. See those in those days, this is under still not yet independence. They wishes to bring the kings and queens back to Mandalay. So th this this was the sentiment of our people. Maybe different with the other peoples, because you know. As a Buddhist, there's nothing, nothingness, see? N nothing to, wh when you pass away, there's nothing. But at the same time, there's kind of an attachment for the family. So this is, it, it is a kind of a human nature. So that's, that, that, that's the way I like to explain. But maybe, see, uh, it is not a very, very easy, I think kind of a walk to do because we have to get the approval from the authorities first from our authorities then from the Indian authorities then both authorities can have to make arrangements to bring back so this is the what I, I'm very uh, uh, sorry that I cannot uh, see uh, answer uh, all what you wishes to know but this is only my part that what I understand. I, th I mean, it's it's a very good question, um, and it's certainly not the first time that someone and I have, have had it um, asked of us about after watching this film. I mean, first of all, I hope you'll see that I'm not advocating either. It's it's really not us two Brits. It's definitely not our decision to make. I think you're absolutely right. Is it the right time, and what would the, what would the political repercussions of it be? Um, and the question of why now. Um, is a fair one um, to bring it back, and I think you know I've chewed this over with so when many it's of many a late night, and I think there's one line in the film that you know we we put in there very purposefully, which is when you're answering that question as you just did then in the press conference is if you were so when what would you do, and you know if your if your great grandfather was buried, you know not where he wanted to be, uh, he'd spent you know a lot of thirty years in exile and he wanted to come home. Um, but this is the fascinating point of it. He's not any ordinary body. He is the embodiment of something else. So yeah, it's not for you or I to answer, I think, but you're absolutely right in raising it as a concern. Question. Uh, I'm Andrew Silver, retired and American. I qualify my question uh, to confess my ignorance of the uh, map of uh, Southeast Asia in the 19th century. So I, I don't know exactly uh, how that relates uh, to answering the question, but uh, I'm interested to know uh, what were the relations of the monarchy with the ethnic minorities uh, before the annexation? And was there much conflict or not? And just a footnote, what was the name of the kingdom? Was it Bama? Myanmar or something else? Do you want to sell it or shall I? <laughs> you, you, you know more than me, I think, about history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, uh, two really good questions. I mean, the answer to the first one, again, we've talked about this a lot. You know, obviously, Myanmar, the territory that we now see as Myanmar, was not a sort of bastion of peace before the British arrived. <laughs> certainly wasn't helped by the arrival of the British, um, but the, you know, it always has been of the region. Um, there have been three major Myanmar empires um, that have been dominated, dominated. It's, you know, it's like the map of Western Europe, um, sort of where do you start and stop? Um, so the relation, when we, we take where Thibor was, at, you know, it's sort of in 1885, um, the institution had been in, in the sort of late Kanban era and I'll be correct if anyone, if, if this is wrong, um, but it, it was the, the, the king's habit of taking about 50 wives um, was actually a sort of pretty neat way of, of knitting a lot of the powerful families in the country together. Um, and, you know, he, he himself was half Shan. I think his wife, when he was annoyed, she was annoyed with him, the queen used to call him um, you, you Shan, something or other. Um, and so, you know, this idea of a sort of the, 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 the royal family mixed different um, ethnicities, 
mean, this is a very long conversation because you can say, you know, ethnic groups, were they being used? Were they being talked about? Was that something that happened afterwards, that more rigid? Uh, I'd go all night. Um, but no, I mean, there were all sorts of, um, of alliances, tributary arrangements. In the late 18th, sorry, the late 19th century, uh, you know, the Kanban kings had been the sort of hegemonic power in what we now see as Myanmar, um, and, but they hadn't been for very long. Um, I mean, that was sort of the irony of the situation is that the, they were almost at the peak of their power in 1824 um, when they bumped straight into the East India Company and then it all went backwards pretty quickly. Um, so my answer to that is, you know, it, it was complicated as it is now. Um, and the second part of the question was, sorry, I've now forgot, taught myself out of that. What was it called? <laughs> um, well, Upper Burma, what was the kingdom called? Well, this is a bit complicated as well. Um, so the, if you read the letters, that, in terms of self-reference, the, 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 the kingdom called itself, I mean, Ava, um, or because of where it was. I mean, the royalty was often, the names were taken uh, from a place. So Mindon, Thibor, these were, pla they were the prince of, they weren't necessarily their names. Um, so the kingdom of Ava, the kingdom of Inwa, was the largest sort of um, Bama power in, in, in the day. It's a bit confusing to me as, as someone who studied this as to when it started to be called Burma. It was certainly being called Burma by the Brits um, and they referred to that territory, whether that was then sort of taken up and more, I mean, it was the late, after the first Burmese War in 1824, that they were actually, the king of Myanmar started to refer him to himself as the king of Burma, king of the Myanmar people. Uh, yeah, it's, sorry, it's very complicated. <laughs> um, but yeah, the name, it's not, Myanmar comes from somewhere, Burma comes from somewhere. These are not sort of inventions of anybody there. They, they go back a long way. No, only for one information, you see. Because since I serve in foreign ministry, see, uh, I have to use two languages. One is English and one is Myanmar language. So, after 18, 1988, it changed to Myanmar. So most of the people, most of the international community understand that the military government changed, but not that uh, see, uh, right to that extent. You know why? Because in English, we write Socialist Republic of the Union of Burma in English, but in our Myanmar language, socially, we don't do Tamara Myanmar Nangano. We put Myanmar, but we never use Burma in our history. It was used by the British. So, but, so, because it, um, an international community thinks that the military government changed, because <laughs> change means not uh, totally changed. Before it was in English, we call it Burma, Union of Burma. From the very beginning, when you got independence, we call it Union of Burma. Then the military uh, 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 socialist government came in and we call it Socialist Republic of the Union of Burma. Mm -hmm. Then after 1988, we, we, we changed the English version to Myanmar version, Myanmar. But in our language, from the very beginning, even my great-grandfather uses his signature as Myanmar King mm. in Myanmar language. Mm. So this is, this is uh, just for information, not for the <laughs> clarification or see, not to, I think, uh, j just for reference. Question? Uh, yeah. Alex mentioned that in the 1950s, your family was who are you? The public eye. Can you identify yourself? Oh, sorry, uh, Sam Sherwood Hale, uh, Rail Professional. It's not a magazine that's anything to do with this. Uh, Alex mentioned that in the 1950s, your family was brought back into the public eye by the Burmese uh, military government at the time. You would have been a teenager. Is that when you first developed this interest in seeing King Chibor returned to Myanmar, or is that something that you developed later in life? Of course. Uh, I do not re recall back to that extent. But what I remember was, in 1993, 
during the military government times, our family first time went to Ratnagiri to offer the, to perform the religious rites. That was, was not performed uh, when my great grandfather passed away in 1993. So I was there. You just imagine this tomb about the size of the trees coming up and all the surroundings were being uh, developed by the other see, uh, buildings. So we are worried in 1993, one day it will be demolished or disappeared. See, because nobody cares. And no gates, nothing. We went to the royal residence and then to the r tombs. It was n nobody is taking care of. Then we uh, request the, our government to assist us to to get uh, see, take care of these because this is under the uh, Indian authority. So our uh, government requests the Indian government to take care, and then it comes to this stage. But from that. 1993, I was already in the foreign ministry, then I have to lead our family. I made all the necessary arrangements, and I got all the traveling arrangements to do all these. And then I realized, because I have to read the rights, because uh, my uncles and my aunts said, I'm taking, I have to take my father's place. My father is a eldest son of the fourth princess. Now you see my aunt and my uncle. My father is the eldest brother. So on his behalf, I have to take charge to read this uh, ceremonial rites. So while I was reading, see, I cannot read till the end. I don't know why. I just read, read, and something struck me See, struck me means something preventing me or I don't know, I don't understand. I cannot carry on because I was crying and see, that kind of very uh, tragic, uh, very, uh, I think, uh, uh, I, I, I felt very tragic, uh, tragically for my great grandfather, see, uh, being left alone in a foreign country. So as a great-grandson, I like to see, take that kind of duty. But what I've mentioned, so if most of the people wanted to take it back. Because if most of the people said, oh, God, don't, we don't care, leave it there, then we cannot say much. We just stay silent and we will. But this is a human nature. It happens. So that kind of, uh, see, uh, that, uh, I think I might not have an uh, answer your question, but this is what my feelings was. Yeah. Th this journey for you began in 1993? Yes. yes. Yeah. That's what, what I officially <laughs> <laughs> agree. But before I was see, not much involved in this royal matters, and yeah. I, I, I just stay uh, see, uh, away from my family. And uh, what, what sort of resources did you use to learn everything that you've learned now, if, 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 you, if you first started learning about this later in life, what, 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 what was not, your sort not of resource? Much. Not, not to learn, because it is all, you can look everywhere. No need to search or find, all, all these are all, you get, this, uh, the, uh, it's available everywhere. But, you know, one sad thing is that, uh, that what uh, Alex mentioned is that history was forgotten. They try to erase the good part of our history since 1885. That, that's <laughs> when when um, we've just had a big royal cremation in Thailand, and uh, you know the, the bones were removed, the relics were taken and installed in a palace, and the ashes were moved to two temples. What exactly is the protocol for a, a Burmese king? I mean, when you talk about repatriating the body, what are you talking about? Is it, is it an urn with his relics? Is it a coffin or, or what? Uh, it's a coffin. So his body is intact? B because when uh, my great-grandma passed away, mm. the, uh, my great-grandmother preserved the body 
in the three layers of coffins to bring back home what her intention was. But before that, her younger sister passed away. That uh, lesser queen already been uh, preserved in the same similar way. And then the two coffins then become uh, the king and the uh, lesser queen, the younger sister of the chief queen. These two coffins were entombed in, the, in, the, in the one tomb, this uh, king and the queen's tomb. Right. Coffins, yes. Well, I think it'd be fascinating because you would have to, rather like the Richard III question, you'd, you know, what, what's the right way to borrow, you know, bury a Plantagenet? Yeah. Um, you, you would have to. There'll be a certain amount of reinvention, I think. But, but were Burmese kings cremated normally, or, or, or what? It was, it was often a pretty uh, dangerous business, being a Burmese monarch. Yeah. Um, but, I, I mean, I, I don't actually know. That's a good question. Question? Sure. Hi, my name's Rebecca. I work in international public health. That's how I'm supposed to identify myself. Um, so thank you for the film. Um, it's really interesting. I was watching it, and I kept waiting for the moment where we heard a little bit more about how the people of Myanmar feel. Um, and then I thought about the title, and it says, We Were Kings. So that oriented me to the perspective of what you were talking about. But my question still remains that, or it's a two-part question. One, um, what, how do the people of Myanmar feel about this? Um, and why did you choose or not choose to include that in your film? Um, well, I'm not from Myanmar, so I'll defer to the chap on the panel that is. Um, obviously, he's got a slight vested interest. <laughs> so, um, I, I honestly don't know, uh, and I wouldn't want to say. I think I've done some pretty unscientific polling, obviously, from doing screenings in Myanmar. I think there's as you'd expect, people who think it's, you know, should definitely come home, people who don't care because, um, you know, life has moved on. And people, the saddest probably chunk is people had no idea he was there in the first place. Uh, as you see from that, the school scene in the film, you know, the actual knowledge, I think Debor is mentioned in one line in a history book in, in, in sort of, I can't remember which standard it is now, but age about 11 or 12, a sentence for a man who reigned in that country for eight years. Um, so I don't know, and I think, you know, I'd be interesting to know about, uh, you know, about that. Um, why didn't we? Um, I mean, it was far too much fun filming with the family uh, and going out doing sort of random vox pops. As I said, you probably could have found, you know, I could have asked three people and got those three things and, and, and chucked them in. I thought it was far more interesting a study, uh, you know, to, to explore what the family felt because you almost had all shades of national opinion in the family itself. And that conversation continues, I can assure you. And I think this is not uh, answering the question. One thing came up in my mind that I might have missed. One of my, uh, see, uh, not duties, but uh, my I cannot say idea also. It comes from the very deep, uh, see, inside me, is that, no, of course, I've been uh, answering that the Suresian monarchy is, I think, out of question. One thing is that I want to restore our traditional values, what we have lost. Of course, we have been lost, first identity and our values and our integrities, you know? Because you know, that our country is still divided. We do not have peace yet. If these traditional values have, will be, see, accepted by themselves, they don't know what they lost. That's a very, I think, uh, I'm very sorry for the, our people. They don't know what they lost. You know, I mean, I mean, in education or every level. So I just want to get back the traditional values. 
traditional values mean not only for the, we, we, we need to have uh, international values also, we have to learn. Not only see a uh, one-sided view to learn only for our country and we do only, that's what I mentioned, see, in, in the film that I'm only for Myanmar and like that. See. But that was uh, kind of a, see, a, a debate or like the explanation among my uh, sister and myself. But sometimes I, when I look, oh, I'm very greedy or I'm very self-centered, see. But the thing is that what we are missing is to get back our traditional values. Why? Because our country is not a monolithic uh, kind of, uh, see, one race country. We have a multinational. That's why unity and diversity is the very main thing that we need to see, uh, carry on or to, to go further. Unity and diversity. Because we are all diversified in, in race and uh, cultures and all these uh, uh, basic, I think, kind of uh, understanding. But since we are now a union, we need to be to be united, although we are diversified. That, that's my only uh, explanation I like to, because I like to add on, because I might not have uh, see, uh, answer what the questions uh, properly or maybe something was missing. Right, one very final question. Um, there was one person in that film who expressed great support for bringing King Tibor back, and that was Senior General Min Aung Lang, who you took to Ratnakiri. Um, and he's been getting some pretty rotten publicity lately for what's been going on, rightly so. But uh, why would the Burmese military, the Myanmar military, wish to bring the body back of the former king? What, what benefit to them is there in doing that? I mean, I think to the gentleman's question earlier, it's, it's, it's part of that same question. I would just clarify, we didn't take... Uh, the senior general to, to India. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't hop in my car. No, but he me. took the trouble to go. Uh, he did. I mean, this was part of the amazing uh, story of the story. And I will definitely come back to, to the question. I mean, you know, what, what's been amazing as part of this film is sort of to meet, meet the man and then this interest grew. And, you know, we were going to go back, the three of us, myself, Max, who directed the film, and, and, and So Win. It was just going to be the three of us in Ratnagiri in December 2016 and it then turned out about a hundred people came from Myanmar such as the snowball that we sort of started mm. um, and that was quite an amazing ceremony to see uh, you know what is the what is the senior general um, what are his motives for being there for doing this I don't know I've never spoken to him um, I think there's you know possibly two I mean one it does you know it, it speaks to that sense of you know, what military men should be doing. I mean, there is a natural symbiosis between the military and monarchy in every country that has a monarchy. It's not surprising that a military man would, would identify with, with, with royalty. Um, you know, the second thing is that um, I think m the history that people are taught in Myanmar is very, actually very royal focused. Not it's necessarily the last king, he's not really talked about. But you, you are, if you, if you grow up in Myanmar, fed on a diet of great kings. So a sort of natural curiosity amongst anyone from Myanmar for, for being part of history. And if you can call up the jet and go, then, then why wouldn't you? As to a more, you know, the, the, a darker motive, I don't know. I think you can, I think you can be um, overly sort of, uh, you know, what's the word, concerned about these things, but then... Myanmar continues to surprise both for good and for bad. So, so when what did the general tell you when you were travelling in that jeep with the doors open? <laughs> <laughs> I think ev everybody jeep. hears. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think no need to. I think uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> repro uh, But uh, I like to, of course, I like to more in go in detail. First, what uh, Alex mentioned, in, in the early uh, two, uh, 2016, we have in Ratnagiri, and we learned only in Ratnagiri that this year, in December 16, will be the 100 years. We are, we are all forgotten. <laughs> we don't know, we do not remember 100 years, see? We just 
just, just very uh, casually. But in Ratnagiri, we learned that, oh, this year, King passed away in 1916, but this is 2016. Hey, Alex, <laughs> this is going to be 100 years. So we have to come back again. So we started this very, f uh, only three people. And when I arrived back home, I talked with my friends and my families. And of course, in 1993, we left to Ratnagiri. We we uh, accompanied by one monk, because we need a Buddhist monk to uh, make the last religious rites. We need the monks. So for this occasion also, we wishes to bring uh, uh, Buddhist monks. And then we discuss among ourselves. And then we managed to invite the most senior monk, highest senior monk in our Buddhist uh, thing, uh, Buddhist level, you see. It's a top Buddhist four, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> and then he, this monk always said, "Okay, he will follow. He will come with us." Then, step by step, becoming bigger and bigger. Then we heard that vice president, not only senior general, vice president is uh, the one who started. Vice president said, "Oh, since these monks are going, we will also <laughs> go in, yeah. because." Because of the vice president, we got the special flight. Mm. Not because of the senior general, see? Because we are missing vice president. <laughs> so vice president and senior ge general, they join this group. And then for, uh, this is like a vice president's visit to India. So the special flight were being uh, arranged and all the uh, uh, necessary protocols will be uh, 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 afforded like that. So, so in 1993, when we started this, it was under, we call it the military government, State Law and Order Restoration Council. At that time, Senior General Tan Shui, now retired, he was the chief, uh, he was the head of the, head of the, see, uh, we call it the uh, chairman of the State Law and Order Registration Council, the title. And then we put up this request letter signed by our relatives through post office. We went to the general post office and registered and sent it to the highest <laughs> rank. So we don't know what will happen. Then about two months time, it came back to the foreign ministry and then it was see, uh, performed as a private visit. Private visit, no, 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 no I think, uh, uh, kind of uh, see, uh, being uh, uh, accorded. So just on a, on a private basis, we went in 1993. So this time, so this has become, uh, see, uh, since Vice President and Senior General involved, the Indian part make a kind of a very high level visit. So in this case, this, uh, what, what I've mentioned, see, they are very much interested. They want to help us. Then I said, uh, we want to bring it back home. Okay, they will assist us. Mm. Th that's it. Because, but to bring it back, it have to be done, see, through parliament, or through uh, authorities, governments, or like that, see? Because you cannot do by ourselves. Not just gonna run over there and dig him up. I think that's the, uh, <laughs> the message. But I mean, to say one final thing, I mean, on that, I mean, the hardest thing about making a film that's 56 minutes long after three and a half years is what you leave out. And, you know, the highlight, or the most, not that I say the highlight, but the kind of most astounding thing that happened in that visit um, was something we haven't even featured in the film, was that, in the morning, we had this ceremony with, you know, the sort of five, six most powerful men in Myanmar at the time, um, and mem members of the royal family from India and, and Myanmar, and it was astonishing. That afternoon, we had over two, we, we went to a, we were going to a small ceremony at a Buddhist shrine that used to be King Thibor's personal shrine, about a mile away from the house. And there were 2,000 people waiting to meet um, and there was this enormous ceremony 
uh, of B Buddhists from, from Maharashtra who'd come just to see the great grandson of the Raja as they knew him. And that was astonishing mm. in terms of a snowballing. Um, but it's a shame we couldn't even fit that in. Right, well, we've run, we've run for two hours, ten minutes. Oh, wow. And Poor you're you. going to keep us that. going for another two hours, ten minutes. No, no, if I may be just <laughs> Very quick. Have you met Aung San Suu Kyi and what is her take on the royalty? And second, very important, did you get a chance to meet the Dalai Lama, who also lives in exile in India, the great Buddhist leader? So have you met either of them? So only one. Uh -huh. Guess who? <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on zero for zero, unfortunately. So of course, uh, during uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's, I think, uh, house arrest, uh, I think in, while she was still under house arrest, there was uh, one uh, Mr. Kambari from UN uh, Secretary General's uh, mission, have a, like a dialogue between government and Dong San Suu Kyi. During that time, I was in charge of protocol at the guest house to welcome Dong San Suu Kyi from her house, and then I bring her from the car to the meeting room to introduce with uh, Mr. Kambari, uh, special envoy of UN and the Secretary General. That was I, what, one of my duty. Because you asked me about this connection with the royal family. So it's very interesting, you see? Because I already mentioned in uh, BBC already also <laughs> in last uh, uh, November, you know? Because I do, I do not remember how many times I've been welcoming her 